Anyway, thank you very much for coming. It is a real honor for us to be here. We had a wonderful day uh, today, and we're absolutely inspired by the work that you're doing, uh, the work that we saw at the school, and the ambitiousness of the project that you're undertaking. So um, we hope that we can add a little bit to the work that you're doing. But again, we just really want to thank you. Okay. What, um, what we thought we would do in the next 20 or 30 minutes is just give you some idea of the roots of this work, the purpose, the framework, and to open it up to questions of, based on our experience working in British Columbia but in other parts of the world. So uh, how many of you have been to British Columbia? Good. <laughs> Well, you're all invited. It is a beautiful part of Canada. It's on the far, far west coast. And uh, we love our place, and we love Barcelona. Just a little bit of the context of our province in terms of the population and the size. Uh, we're organized in school districts. We have 60 districts. We've, most of our, of our children attend public schools. We also have some First Nations schools. And we have a variety of different language groups in the, in the province. We've been working with a network of schools for the last 17 years. So one of our big messages to you is to persevere. Um, we had no idea when we started this work that this is where we would, would be. In fact, if we were, had been told that we would be talking about the network in Barcelona, we would have never <laughs> believed it. Um, we think that over the last 17 years, we've worked with um, over half of the schools in our province. We've worked with um, thousands of teachers and support staff. We work with 100 network leaders. They're all volunteers. We've in been involved in graduate student programs at the university and have had um, several hundred master students and now doctoral students. And we think we've touched about close to half a million students. So here's our first big proposition for you to think about is that inquiry is not an initiative. We never want to hear, oh, inquiry, we did that last year. Now we're doing something else. It's a way of professional being. So we want you to think about this work that you're doing as kind of the essence of who we are as teachers, as educators, and that it is really a way of thinking and a way of being as professionals. So we've learned something about the importance of purpose, of curiosity, of mindset, of coherence and perseverance. And we're going to dive into that with you. I think in our context, and we feel very at home with the Catalan people because I think it's the same, um, we think the education profession is to do good for the world. I know that that's why people go into education, to make, to make a better future for young people and for our countries. Um, and so we have found in our work that collectively deciding from the grassroots, from the people doing the work in schools, um, everybody in the school, uh, deciding what the big goals are, uh, that's very important to our work. So we, uh, we value short, fast goals. In North America, people talk about smart goals, small and specific. But we have found that the hard goals are the ones that motivate people to stay with the work. So um, we found the idea of, of hard goals in, in some business literature, but it's, it has to be heartfelt. It has to be animated. We have to take it seriously. And it has to be difficult, something that requires all of us to achieve. And so all of these have been developed over the long period of our networks. And this is our first one. We want, in where we live, and we want it for the Catalan too, and other places that we've been, that every learner, whether they're a newcom to, newcomer to your territory or whether they live in a family that doesn't have, whether they have a family, whether they have very little money, that every learner who comes to us at the beginning of the education process, uh, that they leave crossing that stage into adulthood with dignity, which means they've always been treated with respect. No racism, no, none of the isms. 
those are bad, that they have a genuine sense of purpose to help themselves and other people make a better world, and that they have genuine options. They have the competencies and the skills that they can move around. And so we want it to be a culture that embraces that everybody who comes walks that that stage, and I know that this is a region, and Barcelona has always been a city where these beliefs are are part of the fabric of, of the city. We also want, in some ways, this one is even harder. Every learner, you know, those curious little people who come to us, we want them to be even more curious when they uh, walk that stage. And we want every educator who works in a school when they finally get their well-deserved retirement, to leave even more curious than when they started the profession. So, uh, you know, not, oh, goodness, how long until I can go, but, oh, my goodness, this is so exciting. I, I want to be like the rose I learned about today. Um, and part of that is um, we want to be able to use, and, and that's really what the networks are for, and we think that they help with sustainability, that we can use the pull of curiosity instead of just pushing down on people through policy to create change. Policy can help, but we think, we think curiosity creates an energy, and we've already seen that here today. So we think for young learners to be curious, that the adults they work with need to be curious, and for us the spiral framework is a way, an organized way of being curious together so that we can talk across places and settings. And we also believe I, I, I was thinking about that as I looked at you. I think there's probably people in this room, if you closed your door, if you were a teacher, and you worked for your whole career, you could create quality inside that classroom, but you cannot get equity for learners by working alone. You have to work as a team. It has to be more than one, because the challenges that young people are presenting us today uh, from their complex lives requires a team. So that's a belief we have. So we have found in our work, uh, and it was fun to see at the school today, Carol Dweck's book, we have found that mindset and the, the knowledge that we now have about growth mindset is absolutely foundational. And that once not all of us, not every teacher, has had the kind of childhood and education that helps to create a growth mindset, and we all have um, slightly different attitudes towards things, but that moving towards a growth mindset, that belief... I don't know how to do this now, or I don't know how to do this yet, but with hard work, with support and strategies, I can learn how to do it, is fundamental to teacher Oops. change Sorry. and learner change. Okay. So we think okay. that matters a lot. So the next thing we want to talk about is why the spiral of inquiry and why you as a, as a region are taking this seriously. And we think that there's some powerful evidence. We, we worked, we've been working with the network, as I said, for, for several years, and we have case studies now of thousands of schools over that time and have seen the difference that it makes when they take inquiry seriously and use a, a coherent approach. And we've also really been influenced by the work in New Zealand. So Helen Timperley, who is one of the leading experts internationally on teacher professional learning, has been um, a colleague and a collaborator with us in, in designing these ideas. There was a very interesting project in New Zealand a few years ago looking at literacy where schools got a lot of support over a six-year period. And her question was, what happens after the initiative ends? So she and one of her colleagues went into uh, 200 schools two years after the literacy strategy had formally come to an end, and they found two big findings which are really important in this context. Uh, the first one was that when the schools applied the strategies that they'd learned during the initiative consistently, they maintained the gains for similar cohorts of students. So that was, that was good. Teachers learned new strategies, they applied them, they, they maintained the gains. The more important finding, though, was this one was that when they applied new <laughs> strategies and they used an inquiry cycle that built the knowledge within the school, they, their gains improved over time, particularly for their most vulnerable students. So when we learned that from Helen and we had our case study, then we spent two years working together 
to develop the framework of the spiral of inquiry, drawing on her knowledge and, and on ours. And just you know, one piece from British Columbia, uh, there on a number of, of um, international measures, we're a pretty strong system. And that's important for us as we, we're drawing on this work to know that you can have some confidence that it is over time making a real difference to, to our learners. So this is, this is just one, one example, but taking a look at some international comparisons, looking at the outcomes in reading and mathematics and equity for 25-year-olds. And from this, this was from the Conference Board of Canada based on the OECD assessments, but we have the least number of students struggling and we have the most number of students at the high, highest levels in reading, which in our context is really important because we have um, poor early childhood programs and we have high childhood poverty, relatively speaking for a, you know, a developed place. So, so it's a teaching effect and we think that that's, that's really important. Um, and we have the highest number of 25-year-olds that have at least two years of post-secondary, which is a proxy for long-term health outcomes as well as contribution to civic society. So we're just telling you that to say you can have some confidence that there are some places that are, are um, doing okay using this as their major approach. The, the last piece, just, just quickly to say why this is important, is that, that there was a, a study done a couple of years ago by a research group from Australia looking at professional learning in high-performing systems. And these were the, the four systems that they looked at, three Asian ones <laughs> with fairly similar cultures, and one kind of weird one in Canada. Um, and we were surprised when we were asked to be part of this study. So, you know, really different cultures. But the, the findings were consistent across the four, that, that this is what makes a difference for teacher professional learning, that it needs to be inquiry-based, we need to work together, it needs to be linked and coherent, and that's why the spiral of inquiry as a framework to develop coherence across your networks of schools, uh, we think is, is so important. That it's led by the profession. The, the um, session that we were at today was led by the, the teachers and the principals with the facilitation, the fantastic facilitation that we saw. And you're going to take your time with this work. It's not going to be a quick fix in the next six months. So that's the, the evidence background. And here's just a quick description of, of what it looks like. OK. Uh, well, how many of you are already extremely familiar with the spiral of inquiry framework? And how many of you just wandered in because you thought it would be nice to sit down on a comfortable chair? Because <laughs> it's very comfortable. Um, uh, I think when, when we talk about this, the stages of the spiral, by the way, we talk about them in an order, um, but they, they can be very fluid and, and move around. Um, but there's essentially six thinking processes. The first one is scanning. The difference for us with scanning is that we start by talking to young people. We don't start with organized uh, data sets. We start with talking to the person in front of us, small data, uh, humans, and try to find out whether they feel they have a sense of belonging and if they actually know what it is that they're learning and why it matters, not what they're doing, what they're learning. And that we call that scanning because it's quite broad and we love it that your networks are using those seven learning principles because we think that's a very powerful framework. Then, unlike the broad stage, there comes a time when you have to make a decision. And at the focus stage, we have to ask ourselves as a school or as a network, what's the one thing that if we focus on it, we're going to have the biggest impact? If you have a whole staff, for example, and you yourself are quite fixed, it might actually be the growth mindset that you decide to focus on as a way of, of moving forward. Um, at the hunch stage, you don't have to take a long time at the hunch stage, but this is a time where uh, Helen has found and we have found that professionally we kind of grow up if we say, 
here are some things that we have control over. What if we did this? Or I wonder if we stopped doing this and did this instead, if that would make a difference. And putting those assumptions out and then testing them, we find a very healthy, healthy thing. Um, uh, then, uh, you know, if you want to move something forward, uh, you have to do some new learning because uh, that's why young people aren't learning to be active people. They're not, um, if they're struggling with anxiety and depression, as many young people are doing right now, then we as the faculty need to learn some more about the best ways of, of having great mental health. So we need to learn that. We need to learn that as a team and, um, and be curious about that new learning. Only now do you get to the action stage, which is the part often in Canada, teachers, we like to go from scanning, oh, there's this problem or challenge, right immediately to action. And this process asks you, asks you to slow down at the beginning, but here you can go, go fast because you've decided on some things that you're going to do differently. Maybe you're going to make sure that there are powerful learning intentions that young people know. And then, you know, the last stage, which goes back into the scanning is, how will we know we're making enough of a difference? So we're looking for those evidence pieces and indicators that say, you know what, we want young people to be much more intellectually engaged. And today we were in a school where you could see that the young people were intellectually engaged. Uh, what, what are the things that would tell us that? What would they say? What would we see? Um, that's really important. So that's a very quick trip through the dance of the spiral, um, and the designer, the, the image was made by a designer who actually is also teaches design, and she said there's an inner circle there, so that's where tired teachers go to rest after they've done a lot of, of thinking together, because it does require some intellectual energy at the beginning before you get the lift off, which you do get, we know that now. So one of the things that, that we've learned about building curiosity in teachers is that they're curious about what's going on for their learners and that we need to provide the space and the time for teachers to talk to and listen to learners in this process. And we call it the, the four questions, but it's really one question and then three more. And these questions are so important to us that in the schools that we work with directly in our networks, we insist that they start with these questions. So here's the first one. We believe that in every young person needs to have two adults who believe they'll be a success in life. And those people need to be in the school. So we want to ask students in a variety of ways, if they can name two adults, and if they can, how is it that those adults demonstrate their, their belief that they will be successful? It's a very important question. It comes from the social-emotional research, and it is a uh, proxy. It's a way of determining the extent to which kids feel or young people feel connected, and there's also a direct correlation to their academic achievement. So we need to know, and then if we find that there's a student or two students or three students who don't have two adults that believe in them, then we need to act on that right away. The next three questions come from the work of uh, John Hattie and Helen Timperley on feedback. It's also connected to um, the sixth learning principle, which is around assessment for learning and the importance of feedback. And it's feedback from the learners to the teachers. So we want to know that each young person, whether they're five years old or 18 years old, can say in their own words what they're learning and why it's important. Whether it's in science or history or English literature, what is it that they're learning and why is it important? Most students in our settings can say what they're doing. It's a very different question to ask them what they're learning and why it's important. So we want that to become a way of life as part of the beginning stages of the spiral, because it's around learner agency. And then we want to ask them, how's it going? Do they have some criteria to assess themselves? And have they had the coaching feedback that lets them know what their next step is? 
So these are the starting questions for scanning. They're informed by the learning principles, and they generate the kind of curiosity that we want in teachers that propels them to want to know more and to learn more. Yeah, I think maybe we should say too that when we do this work, we also ask young people not only why it's important, what are you learning, why it's important, but can you, can you give us some examples of how you use your knowledge of your growth mindset outside of school so that young people begin to learn that the things we do in school have some connection to their lives and that that's why we're doing them. So just to, to kind of wrap this up and then to open it up for discussions, we found that it's absolutely critically important for us to be clear on our purpose. And it was really encouraging today to hear from the teachers and the, the, the people that were at the meetings, the clarity of um, the imperative of what you're doing as a society around equity and quality and fairness and democracy. It gets really, really clear. And that's what your network is all about. So good for you. <laughs> uh, the second is that we really want to develop the conditions for professional curiosity. And that requires us taking our time. So we say sometimes you need to slow down to pick up the pace of change. And not just to hop from one thing to another, but to <laughs> use the, this uh, framework as a way of building adult curiosity and building learner curiosity. And then the importance of, of a coherent framework. There are lots of models um, around action research, and, and we have uh, many, many examples of that in, in North America, that start with a teacher interest or teacher curiosity, and there's nothing wrong with that. But what we want to do is do this as a team where we're starting with a deep understanding of what's going on for our learners, as opposed to what we think might be fun or interesting to do. So it's quite different when we start with the needs of the learners as opposed to the interests of the, the teachers. And we've also learned a lot about the importance of teamwork, which you are modeling so exceptionally here with the, the links across your associations and, and persistence. So, our question to, to you and to ourselves is, how will we work together through this next couple of years that you've got with your network, but also beyond that, beyond the formal conclusion of, of this, this project that you're on, so that, in our words, every young person in the Catalan region will cross that stage to adulthood with dignity, purpose, and options, if you buy that that's an important thing to do. And the other, the other thing that we've learned is perseverance, that this work really takes time and that there's going to be times when it gets a little bit difficult and it gets challenging. It sounds easy to describe the stages of the spiral, but once you get into it, it is much more complex than, than it seems. And you need to be able to, to look to each other for support and to your facilitators to keep that work going. We use the, the image of the bamboo. Um, when bamboo is first planted, you don't see much happening above the surface. Everything is taking place underneath. It takes about seven years for the roots of bamboo to become so locked in. I see some people nodding. You've tried to get it out of your garden. Uh, you need dynamite to do that. That's what we want. We want the roots to be so strong uh, that it's going to stay for a long, long time. So we need to take, take our time to create the foundation so that the work will, will really take hold. And the last point, um, this is a, um, a word from the Lilwat language, which is where the, um, the Winter Olympics in 2010 were in Canada, and they were on Whistler, and this is, this is a word from the indigenous language. And it's being in that place of dissonance and uncertainty in the anticipation of new knowledge. And the spiral of inquiry requires us to be somewhat uncertain because we can't predict where it's going to take us. And we think that this term, quilelup, really represents 
that place of uncertainty. We know we're going to be going to someplace better, but we're not quite sure necessarily how we're going to, to get there. So um, we'd just like to thank you very much, and we'll be opening it up to questions, and really hope that you will stay in touch and stay in contact. And I just want to end with a quick story of what happened today, if I may. One of the, we have case studies on our, our website, which is up there from all of our schools, and the group today had translated one of the case studies, a Begonia translated case study from a small school in northern British Columbia, and there it was out on the table. We took a picture of the, sent it to the school. <laughs> they had an assembly today, and they read the case study out loud in Catalan uh, in this tiny town, and the parents were invited, and they just were so, um, they were so proud that the, the work that they were doing was being used here. And we look forward to a reciprocal relationship <laughs> where we're just learning from each other as part of the fabric of being um, a great couple of countries. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
a different form of assessment that's more like coaching and less like judging, um, began to, to change quite profoundly. And so a school that started you know, with a book, which was a traditional way for teachers to start, read a book, make a book, um, two years later, they had become a nature school and they were doing most of their learning outside. And they had formed a partnership with a, a university and a scientist and an aquarium and had profoundly changed in ways that were you know, much more represented by the innovative learning environment work um, that, that uh, David Istance and other people have been doing over time. So it's sort of the reality of seeing those cases that small changes by a few people uh, have ended up dramatically changing what people will do with young people so that you can go into not every school where, where we work, but you can go into lots of schools and see Italian forms of early childhood, you know, Reggio-inspired provocation work where uh, a few years ago it would be quite different. And so I think for us, looking back retrospectively, uh, we see the power of people, just like with children, as soon as as young people are allowed to be intellectually curious, which apparently happens when we smile at them, build a relationship, and tell them small stories about our own life when we were their age. That's what the research says about curiosity in North America, which is quite a nice pedagogy. As soon as those small acts, they act like seeds, and, and later ecosystems are created, which is fascinating to us and encouraging because I think that's what we want. Yeah, I think that we'd say that innovation floats on a sea of inquiry, which means that we'll start possibly with a relatively small question, but it builds the confidence to go bigger and bigger and bigger. And now we, we, have, we have schools that have radically transformed. And as Linda said, they may have started with a small, a small question. And I, oh, and I think too, when I've talked to people who, you know, there's a, in, in New York, there's a zone, an innovation zone. So 10 schools innovate on behalf of everybody else. When, when I've talked to the person who was leading that process, she said that the leaders of those schools were people who were always intellectually curious. They were always trying to change the system. And we think, at least in our area, and I think, I think the, this area is like that too, that if everybody gets a little bit curious, the chance of system change is stronger mm -hmm. than if a few people get curious and then we go and stare at them for a while and say, ooh, you know, they're so unusual, we could never do that. Once we get people on that curiosity mm -hmm. uh, uh, boat trip, we think you get a fleet. <laughs> <laughs> So first of all, thank you very much for having us here in this debate on education. I think that these debates on education have been on for 12 or 14 years, and that's very good for our curiosity, because one thing is having your mouth open, but when you receive good food, that's nice and great, and that's what it happens every time here. We get this very nice food. So as the representative of the Consortium of Barcelona, I would like to say that in Canada and also in our network, we are sharing this methodology because we share many, many things. And this is so nice to see that in this purpose, when we started these networks, because what we wanted to do was to make sure that this curiosity was a systemic one. We wanted to make sure that the uh, teachers community become a learning community also. And we wanted to make sure that this curiosity would be sustainable. And we wanted to share it in networks. We didn't want any school to uh, be uh, not on board. And another thing that we share with you is that this uh, process has to be on, in the long term and sustained. So my question is, how? can we make sure that this process is sustainable and sustained? How can we make sure that this curiosity is not, is never ending? How can we keep curious all the time? 
so that we can have this sustained quality for everybody. Because we want to be always learners' communities. We also. So how can we open our eyes and our mouths to um, keep always uh, being like learners also? So um, how can we make sure that the project is sustainable and sustained? Well, I'll, I'll start. I think that, um, first of all, it's our attitude that we bring as the leaders of this work that we're modeling curiosity ourselves. Um, I think that for us, because, because it's been voluntary, that has been huge in, in our province. It hasn't been mandated by the government. We actually, when the government tells us to do something as teachers in British Columbia, we tend to be rather rebellious. And it doesn't even matter if it's a good idea, uh, we'll refuse. <laughs> um, in fact, we had our premier was very big a few years ago on healthy food. And instead of eating carrots, teachers ate cheesies. <laughs> so, so, so mandates um, have not worked for us. Voluntary <laughs> um, participation, <laughs> and then thanking people. So, so in in our schools, they volunteer, and at the end of the year, we ask every school to share publicly what they've done, and we find some way of thanking them for their their work. It may be a small grant. It may be uh, some additional additional professional learning or resources, but saying thank you, having it voluntary. And then a key for us has been leadership development at the same time. So in our province, while we've had the networks, we've also had 10 years of leadership development at the master's level at universities and partnership with universities so that we're developing uh, school principals and teacher leaders and district leaders with a deep understanding of the, of the inquiry process, and that's been really helpful. And out of that group have come kind of the next generation of system leaders that are kind of extending and deepening the work. So uh, voluntary, invitational, um, gratitude, some respect, and then developing leaders through formal leadership programs, I think, has helped in our, in our context. Yeah, and I, I think I would add um, parties. Um, once a year, we have what we call a symposium. It's now, it's grown to 350 people. But let's say it was the 200 people in this room. Um, every May, you would know that you were going to come to a party. If you were a network leader, you would come to a nice place and we would have some lovely appetizers and some wine, maybe some music. Um, then we would learn something for the next um, day and a half. <laughs> and um, it feels like a celebration every time we have that symposium. So if somebody in this room was willing to lead that, by the way, these parties have to take place in beautiful locations. <laughs> and we have a very nice wine industry in BC, so in wineries, in golf courses, in the winter when they're not busy, <laughs> our, our weather's bad, so we have lots of nice places. But you know that, that sense of fun as a profession and coming together and being proud of each other's work is on behalf of you know, our country, our region. That's the feeling that we want. And BC, we do work with the region above us, which is called the Yukon, which is a very, uh, it's filled with bears and moose and exciting animals. And it's a very remote part of the world. But you know what, it's just like a big family reunion when we get together. And I think that's part of sustaining the work is that sense of we're a group of people who are going to stay with us. And, and we're going to work to get those last group of the hardest kids across that stage. And you know, you need to have a party to raise your spirits and, and to say, you know, good for us. So I think that's important. Um, one of the advantages of the of the uh, following what you have said, uh, one of the advantages of what of the ecosystem that we have now is precisely that uh, both public administrations and and associations that are uh, being facilitators of the process of change are just catalyzing what the what the schools already are doing. Uh, so we have. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of schools uh, with uh, great professionals that are working hard to try to do this update and to 
uh, to put the school uh, in a position uh, able to both to answer these big challenges and to this idea of uh, uh, dignity, purpose, and opportunities that, that, that you mentioned before. Uh, the question is, uh, in uh, that the pressure for change sometimes create a puzzling situation on whether to start with. And uh, the, spiral, the spiral of inquiry somehow try to, to go step by step on the process of change, not to feel overwhelmed by it. But the process of change at the same time could be of different levels. It's not the same to try uh, the same to try to transform the whole assessment system of the school, than to try to create some interaction among several disciplines to do a uh, interdisciplinary uh, project. How do you think that the methodology that the spiral of, the spiral of inquiry could be used in these different levels? How thinking in a in a principal of a school or even a group of teachers, how do you think that they could understand the methodology to answer different levels of change? A more systemic for the whole institution, are they more particular for a group of teachers on a, on a particular level? Um, I'll just start with one example and then Linda will have a smarter answer. Um, an elementary school, primary school, in the identification process of what's going on for our learners, we're concerned about a group of um, grade five and six, so 10 and 11 year olds, who were showing increased levels of anxiety. The initial response would be, let's deal with anxiety. Let's do some mindfulness training. Let's you know, do yoga, whatever it is. Uh, but they were forced through this process to go more deeply and then to go back and to really listen to the learners. What they found out was that underlying the anxiety, it was different in mathematics than it was in language arts. And it's because the assessment practices in mathematics were different than they were in language arts. And it's because the teachers were less confident in math than they were in language arts. So they were using a very traditional method of assessment. So instead of dealing with anxiety, they changed their assessment practices. That school, they also did some other things around you know, the connectedness of the kids, but that school has now made radical changes and is seen as a lighthouse school in reporting to parents and, and assessments. So I think that um, it, it, it's getting really underneath what's happening. Then it became a school-wide change. Now that's influencing the other 30 schools in their their district. I don't know if that answers the question necessarily, but I think that, that for us it's an important example. Um, uh, my, my view would be that um, because there are a set of processes, I don't broad scanning, then making a shared decision, um, it works at the level of, of groups of young people in a school. If we have many young people who want to do service learning and make their community a better place. They can scan, they can take a focus, they can, you know, so, and we have groups of parents who know that they grew up in very fixed mindsets, and so they do study, group book study of, of the mindset book and watch the videos and decide that they want to start using different kind of language at home that's more growth oriented and less fixed to complement the work of the school. We have seen, I think we're going to see here, um, uh, we have 16 districts that are working as a network, as a consortium, and in each one of those 16 districts, they're trying to make this a way of life, and they approach it, really, the processes are the same. I think that's, I think there's an elegance to the fact that you can use the same processes, and we actually now, and we learned from Australia, they don't call it the spirals of inquiry, they just call it the spirals, and every two weeks, every teacher gets together during school time and works on a shared challenge and other schools come and watch um, through the miracles of technology, watch them doing their, their intellectual processing so that they can learn to do the same thing. So I, I think we've seen now how it can work in whole systems. We also, and I know this is being videotaped so I would hope people wouldn't tweet this, but we've also been in countries and places where we can see 
what they're doing is not going to work. Because there's no, there's no voluntary spirit. You have to, you can't, to us, to say you can have a organized, um, top-down network means it's not a network. You know, uh, it was a Spaniard who taught us all about networks. I mean, they're voluntary. You come together to create a social movement, to do something good. So it can work at all of the different levels of the system, but you have to have the right conditions. You have to have the teamwork, which you have here. You have to have the intellectual conversations mm -hmm. to understand the processes. You have to be willing to give something a go, which, you know, Gaudi clearly was good at that, and Bouli and <laughs> other people who are, it's part of your national character to give things a go, to dance in the square, and you need to have that spirit. And um, somebody will get this book at the end of the day. This is the very, um, we, we always bring something from our territory. It's part of our tradition. And this is a book um, about, you know, what bears are, you know, those scary big animals. This is what the moons, the phases of the moons look like to bears, through the eyes of bears, the worldview of bears, on our very furthest mm -hmm. island. Mm -hmm. So you're here in this beautiful mm -hmm. Mediterranean. We're over there mm -hmm. in the Pacific. And seven-year-old have made big fabric art and have thought about what the bears look like. So we'll pass this around and then you get it to come into your life if you wave at the end. So have a look. Mm. Even works for bears. Communities <laughs> and bears. La recepta màgica, no? Perquè les coses vagin millor, perquè... A magical recipe. So we need to know what the purpose is and we need to go all together towards the same direction and the learners need to be connected to that purpose and they need to feel they are concerned. We have very high expectations because uh, you said all the learners uh, need to have two adults believing in the success of their future. That's very important, but that's very ambitious at the same time. And then another basic thing, and it's very basic, but it's very important. You need to ask the right questions. So the fact of asking to have two adults that believe in you, well, that's very simple, but that's crucial. So this may be relatively simple. What I think is more complex is this idea of coherence among teams. How? All these different people. We know that our actions will impact on this same group of pupils. How can we make sure that all our actions are coherent? How can we make sure that they perceive from us that we are all aligned? And how can teachers advance in this coherent way and so how can we make sure that our message are all coherent to me these coherent conditions are complicated because sometimes teams are very volatile people change jobs so how can we make sure that this is part of our school culture how can we um, have this coherence that's to me the most complicated thing Oh, okay. Um, that's a good, no, they're all really good questions. I think for us, um, the, the coherence comes through the dialogue. And it comes from taking a focus, and it comes from sharing a language. So if we are talking with young people about you know, what should our focus be, you know, we're going to do, we're going to do something good for our area of Barcelona, and we, we talk that way in the classroom, and then we talk that way with the other, over time through the networks, it simply becomes coherent. The coherence grows in that healthy ecosystem way. Where I think you don't get coherence is where, you know, people do things and, you know, will get coherence by commanding that people do things. Uh, as we said, we're rebellious people. It doesn't work in our culture. It might in some of the other cultures. Um, so I, I say share a common language that's a learning-oriented language. Share the seven learning principles because they're powerful and helpful. Uh, share frameworks that make sense to you. Don't don't accept a framework just because somebody comes and says we love Barcelona and so you know this makes sense to us. You know, uh, interrogate it, and 
uh, I think what we've seen, I think it's very interesting in Sydney, Australia, to watch the networks there that are growing. They have the support of the department, but it's led from the schools, and they are getting incredible coherence through their work. It doesn't mean that everybody chooses the same focus. It just means that they can talk together about essentially school by school um, experiments that are powerful and well informed. And we do believe, and that would be uh, something, um, the, the study of action, individual action research uh, by researchers hasn't been able to show a collective impact. I think the study of this kind of process has come out of when, when schools work together in coherent ways, in an informed way, um, they make an impact. How can we do more of that as our professional learning? So I think, you know, Helen, if she was here, would say the whole spiral process, that's how really strong professional learning happens. And we have found that actually it works on the business side of our organizations too, that the business people say, well, this is kind of exactly what we do, including, by the way, uh, governments don't like the word hunch. They like to change that to hypothesis and other, <laughs> you know, more challenging words. But part of it is using everyday language that a child can use, a parent can use, mm -hmm. a trustee can use, a mayor can use. I'm sure your mayor, this would make sense to her. If you can use the same language, there's a power to that and it creates an energy and I think that does give you coherence over time. I just add to that, having regular rhythms also really helps. So in, in our mm -hmm. networks, there's a set time that schools meet. It's four times a year. It's not a lot, but they know that this is when they're going to be getting together. Then within the school, to have regular times when this is front and center on meeting agendas, whether it's every two weeks or whatever, but that it's always visible and that we also make it visible to our parents and to our communities as well. So there's there's some public um, sharing about what we're doing that I, I think helps create that coherence. But the language is really, really important. Well, maybe, maybe following <laughs> this, this uh, idea, the, um, the logic of the framework and of the um, Maybe the horizon, the common horizon that, that the, the whole system has on on how to update. Uh, sometimes the problem with the change, even with a hunch, is that you don't know whether you are doing what is relevant to do, no? And you might be doing something that is not uh, your core problem, mm -hmm. and you are doing something that is on the side. Um, on the on the initiatives that we all share, uh, the one led by the consortium, particularly, um, um, we have this idea of the purpose that links totally of what you said, this idea of empowering kids to be able to have a purpose on their lives, positive contribution to society, and being able to have options uh, for their lives, and also the seven principles as a way uh, to somehow uh, clarify which kind of learning practices mm -hmm. you have to have mm -hmm. to reach this purpose. Now, uh, one of the, of the advantages of the methodology is that uses the framework as a way to, uh, to improve without getting lost. Could you go a little bit deeper on that? I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> She's thinking. <laughs> So I, I think the question is how does the, how can we use this framework uh, to keep the focus on what's important without uh, getting um, lost? Yeah, let me, let me say it another way. You have uh, one of the, of the risks of precisely the pressure for, uh, for change or for innovation is that you do innovations of things that are useless. Mm -hmm. uh, you use an iPad, you put iPads right. for all the kids Perfect. to do the homework that they were doing in the 60s. No? Yeah. Uh, you change the... Yeah. The, the timetable. The time exactly. So how do, you, how do you... How the methodology could be used to empower schools to take right decisions for right challenges? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so that's why the seven principles have been so important in, for us. Um, 
being involved in the the ILE work as it, as we were, we were one of the learning labs, and kind of being immersed in in the um, the theory behind the seven principles has been enormously helpful. We had at the same time as that work was taking place in in um, you know, through the OECD in our province, there was a lot of excitement around technology and around innovation and a lot of um, stupid things uh, were being advanced or suggested because it was, it was innovative. We loved the seven principles because the you know the evidence, or the you know the statement from from that work was, unless all of those seven principles, not just one, but all seven are in place, you can't call yourself an innovative learning environment. That provided the discipline that we needed to um, to avoid you know less uh, robust um, approaches. That's part one. The second thing I say is that we mm -hmm. have to create the cultures within our schools that we challenge each other's assumptions and that everybody has an opinion about why things are the way they are in the school. Sometimes it's the per person with the loudest voice that dominates that discussion and we need to have the courage to confront that and to really say what's actually going on for our learners and how do we know mm. so that we are pushing each other's thinking in a very um, critically respectful way. And I would say, I think, um, and again, I would use the example of the Australian schools in the Sydney area, in the poor area of Sydney. Um, they have a very disciplined way of making sure that every teacher who comes to one of these meetings um, prepares a short piece of evidence-informed study so if they're trying to uh, improve in an area and they've chosen a focus, they actively search on the internet in intellectual sources for the latest thinking. And they, they actually use a timer. We would not do this in Canada, but they use a timer. People are only allowed to talk for two minutes about what they've learned. But the meeting starts with what they've found in the world that's powerful. And I think that discipline over time is, is pretty impressive because there are packages in North America, you can imagine there's a lot, that say, you know, buy me and everything will go up by 10%. Yay, it's like a pill. Um, most of the things that we're trying to do collectively um, are not like that. They, they require dialogue, they require relationship, they require deep learning. Deep learning means it will transfer to another situation. And um, and I also would like to do a shout out uh, to your facilitators. We've seen a lot of facilitators, I think in a very skillful way, the ones that we've seen so far know how to build in, in a gentle way, hmm, uh, maybe we need a little bit more evidence about whether that would be a productive approach, not in a way that squishes people's enthusiasm, but in a way that informs it with dignity and gives people a sense of purpose. So there's a role for powerful facilitation in this too, hopefully in an ongoing way. I like this idea of uh, slowing down and also having this pace and this rhythm, this sequence. And then something that you have said. You have said that this work of uh, inquiry has to involve of the, all the community agents. So young people, teachers, but also families. So how can we also make sure that there is this conversation at home, this conversation on education beyond the homework and the grades? So how can we foster this curiosity in the households. How did you do that in Canada? Uh, I'll, I'll start on that. How many of you are teachers or directors, you know, principals? Okay, so here's one, here's one strategy. Um, you put the four questions in a little brochure or a little blog, 
and if your parents, you know, use technology, then at the right time in the development of the school, you send those four questions to parents and say, we are regularly talking with the young people in our building about whether they feel mm -hmm. that there's two people who believe in them at school, and uh, we're asking them about what they're learning, and we're asking them how they're going, and what their next step is. And we would like you to do that too. And that starts um, a dialogue. You can't send that home too quickly before the teachers actually know the questions and have tried them out yourself because that's embarrassing to teachers. You want a chance to get, you know, to lead in the game. But at a, at a good point, our most rapidly improving equity district in the province, the, the superintendent used that strategy in two places. And um, our graduation and completion rates in those districts over three years have improved by 30 or 40 percent with the most difficult mm -hmm. children. So I would say that is a mm -hmm. one powerful strategy. The second thing I would just say quickly is that New Zealand in their network strategy has young people doing learning maps. Uh, so if we were in a class there, we would all put our picture of ourselves in the center, and then we would draw arrows of different thicknesses to the people who help us learn and, um, and who we help learn. And they take five months to build those maps, but those maps go home to the families, they go out into the community, everybody consults on the maps. In Canada, we would be too impatient to take five months. But in New Zealand, that's been a powerful strategy. And by the end of that five months, and it's easy to learn on the internet, um, everybody has come to a consensus. And then for the next three years, they follow that as the focus because it's a community focus, not just a school focus. And we think that's powerful. We admire that work. Uh, the other thing that I'd say, if you're interested in the learning maps, the website for it is Infinity Learns. And it is a very good strategy for involving parents in understanding what's going on. Infinity Learns? Infinity Learns. Dot what? Just if you Google Infinity okay. Learns, it'll come up. Yeah. Um, the other thing that we found is that Carol Dweck's work has been really helpful. So for parents to understand mindset and the language that we're trying to use with learners that they, that with effort, strategies, and support, they can get better at just about anything, and the kind of language that encourages that stance as opposed to discourages it. We found parents have responded really positively to that, and having that conversation first um, before we explain the changes that we're making has been really, really helpful. And the last thing is just simple strategies, like uh, often, at least in our culture, when, when kids come home from school, the, the mother or father will say, well, you know, how was school today? Or what did you do today? And it's a conversation ender. You know, th they say nothing or fine. <laughs> um, so it's providing parents with a list of questions that they can ask that open up the conversation that are connected and linked to the focus area of the school has also been really helpful. Just very simple questions that change the conversation. Uh, and the last thing is that our, our uh, you may do this already, but our parent-teacher interviews are now three-way interviews where the student leads the conversation uh, with their parent and their teacher and shows the portfolio of their of their work. And so it's very much owned by the by the the student as opposed to the teacher or the parent. Just a, a very fast question before turning to the um, to the participation of of, uh, of um, the other people uh, related with the um, with the interaction with universities. Uh, one key element for education change is um, the impact on on teachers' training uh, and also the, the development of, of creation of evidences, assessment, etc. Um, I'm here, one of the organizers of the event, the walk tomorrow is holding a seminar that we are going to go deeper on that. But maybe it could be good uh, if you could explain a little bit uh, your work with universities related with both uh, interaction with teachers' training and assessment mm -hmm. and, and determination of evidences. Um, can you hear me with this? Yes. Okay. Um, 
it's um, it's partly a sad story, and then it's a happy story. Um, at the beginning, through the networks, we tried to make a link with our local university, and um, because because this work is practical, they couldn't. The person to whom we were speaking couldn't see a link. It's an embarrassing story that we only usually tell after we've had a glass or two of wine. Um, so we looked for partners in universities in other countries. Um, and we found um, the University of Auckland, very powerful research on, on professional learning and on leadership there. We found um, powerful assessment work in Ontario, Dr. Lorna Earle on her assessment as learning, and Dylan mm -hmm. Wilm and other people. We, we sought out the intellectual community from other mm -hmm. places. Interestingly, what's happened is that there's been a change of personnel at the level of the uh, most important university in BC is the, is the University of BC. And now they're actually a sponsor of the work. And interestingly, um, the production of, first of all, the, the book, The Spirals of Inquiry, which they asked if they could use with their student teachers, was an important step because they produce about a thousand student teachers a year. But also the production of the playbook, which is kind of uh, a children's version of the ideas, it's in plain language, it's got illustrations, has been an important uh, role for the universities because the faculty has been able to adopt it and it's actually being used in um, in a refugee camp in Kenya which is a joint uh, initiative of the University of Moy and of UBC helping young people in the camp learn to be teachers so that they can teach the younger children in the mm -hmm. camp so I think when we see mm -hmm. those kinds of links and mm -hmm. the now thousands of teachers coming into the profession and being being inducted into the profession in schools that are using the spirals mm -hmm. as, as adults, this has really uh, yeah. helped the work. Yeah, so s specifically uh, in five of our nine teacher education programs now in the province, the spiral of inquiry is the methodology that new teachers are learning. And their, their practicum placements or their practice teaching placements are with teachers in schools that are also using the process. Now we've got, um, instead of, of the, the students being on campus, they're learning, the universities are bringing the learning into the schools. So their teacher training is taking place in schools. So that's been quite, quite significant. And then the master's programs have been extremely important as well. So now we have, mm. have um, graduates of master's programs are now teaching in teacher education programs. So it's becoming uh, a deepening spiral of connections through through the universities. So initially, no support, no interest, and just some humiliation. And now uh, a lot of support and a lot of interest, and really, really taking hold. So again, it's a, it's our our you know it's the um, the bamboo me metaphor that we just <laughs> we just didn't give up. But now it, we're in a, a very positive place. Uh, we use the term in Canada, Aboriginal, to refer to um, First Nations, Métis, which is a combination of French Canadian and First Nations, and Inuit, which you may know as Eskimo. So it's a, it's a big term, and it's a it's a struggling population. Um, we've had for the last nine years a network focused on. Aboriginal education, and what we've found has been phenomenally important. It was when teachers were able to approach the challenges of dealing with the needs of their Aboriginal kids through curiosity as opposed to through guilt, uh, that it really opened things up that before a lot of teachers felt, I don't want to touch this, I don't know what to do, I'm going to make a mistake, I don't have the resources. So it's been uh, way more successful than we thought initially, and, so, and it's the, the spiral when we say, what's going on for our learners? Well, what's going on for our, our Aboriginal learners? What's going on for their families? What's going on for their communities? And how can we work together? It's been, it's been really encouraging. We have the most uh, rapidly improving results for our Aboriginal kids in British Columbia than anywhere else in, in Canada. Um, in Australia, say it's early days that there's still a lot of work to be done. However, there is interest and there's curiosity now. In New Zealand is probably where we look to 
for the, the um, strongest emphasis probably over the last 20 years on, on Maori and now Pacifica kids. Um, but the, it's, it's a story of hope and of promise and of creating the, um, the conditions for teachers to feel capable as opposed to defeated. No, and I would say our third goal of our networks is that every young person and every adult in British Columbia and the Yukon will acquire an indigenous worldview because we think that's the way to stop racism and, and the, the effects of colonization because the disadvantage is, has been created by removing religion, language, culture. Who would have some feeling of what that what that's like, not to have your language and culture appreciated and valued, actually taken away from you. So um, it's a powerful question, and it's it's the most important mm -hmm. thing that we think that we can do. Mm -hmm. And by acquiring, and that's why I like the bear book. You know, what what does the moon look like through the eyes of of bears? By acquiring a different worldview, we know that makes all of us smarter. And in particularly in the indigenous worldview we've we've been influenced by to know you know to be to do uh, and learn to live together but what that framework didn't provide from Dolores it didn't say and let's all learn to respect the natural world and in every country where there's an indigenous population that's what those cultures were always good at they are always had a deeply respectful relationship with nature so they made decisions about working with the natural world around what would be good over the next seven generations and from our perspective if the world needs anything right now it needs to have a, a deeper uh, that's why we love the nature schools and we loved Rosa who we met earlier today your educational pioneer who was doing nature schools you know back in in the early uh, 1900s. Yay, Rosa. Uh, <laughs> clearly an indigenous spirited woman <laughs> of her time. There's some wonderful research. This is not what I would say to them, but I would say to you. Mm -hmm. There's some wonderful research in New Zealand that said teachers do not resist change. They have just been on the receiving end of terrible changes that weren't sustained, that were goofy in the first place. You know, get this computer, your life will be better. Well, there's no plugs and there's no internet, but, you know, take it anyway. Uh, and that they've learned to be cautious about change. And that if we're really well organized in our rhythms and our approaches, every teacher will change. I believe that research and it's, it's, it's a very powerful study. So if you take that perspective, yes, absolutely, there are people who will be more and less enthusiastic. Then the leadership question for those people who are formal leaders or informal teacher leaders who you have in this room um, is to get the grain size right. And that is to take the piece of change that for, it's the zone of proximal development for adults. It's to get the piece of change that's the right size that the person won't feel paralyzed with perfection, I can't do this, that they actually can. And we have found that the assessment for learning repertoire is a very good place for people to start because once young people can actually figure out what it is that the teacher is trying to help them to learn and the teacher has that satisfaction of knowing, oh, they actually understand that I'm trying to get them to be better Catalans or to be a force for good in the world or <laughs> learn you know, whatever powerful things you want them to learn. Then once people get on that, it's like one of those airport sidewalks, you know, you step on, it feels like a little step, you hold on, but you know, before you know it, you're creating the next nature school. Uh, I think it's, the skill is in the grain size, and I have, you know, we both collectively worked with tens of thousands of teachers, and uh, some of our most excited teachers are in their age 50s and 60s and 70s, they went into teaching to make a change. They got discouraged by bad systems and they've come back to life in the last five or 10 years of their career. Mm -hmm. It's a very exciting thing. So mm -hmm. the grain size and mm -hmm. managing the risks so mm -hmm. people don't have a nervous breakdown when you're telling them about their, the change. Seeing the, yeah. somebody who's kind of like them get the, get the zone of proximal development yeah. right. And I just add two things to that. I think that the, the growth mindset research, that's why we 
emphasize it so often, is having that discussion within the staff around the impact of language. Uh, for some teachers, then thinking about their own experience as learners uh, and the impact of that teacher who believed in them can start to create their thinking and also thinking about their own children. Um, so, so really having that conversation around the impact of mindset is number one. The second thing is not waiting within the school for everybody to be ready to move, but to get started and to always find this place for people to come in when they're ready. So it's never a closed group or a fixed club within the school. It's open. We're going to support the people that are on the move, and we're always going to be encouraged to the the ones as they're ready. Uh, so that when I talked earlier about the regular rhythms, that on a monthly basis people are sharing what they're doing, so everybody's learning whether they're taking the step then themselves or not. Um, and finally, you know, we just haven't found um, teachers who, when we ask that question, you know, can you name two adults who believe you'll be a success in life? Sometimes it is those teachers that we think are fixed or kind of negative, but they have an impact in a different way on kids. And when we get that information and we tell those teachers that, gee, I was talking to Marina today and she said that, you know, every day you do this and how important that is to her, we just see people grow. So it's taking a more strength-based, appreciative stance mm -hmm. and finding those, um, even if it's, we have to work really hard to find it, but to find those little gifts in the people that are most resistant, we can open them up. And I would just add, and this is for those of you who are interested in practice, our schools are having a lot of fun by having growth mindset assemblies where every adult says, you know, so the principal will come out with his ukulele and say, I've never played a ukulele, here's how it sounds right now. And then they'll come back the next month and, you know, they can play one chord or something like that. It creates a culture, so then other teachers have said, well, I'm, you know, one of our famous stories is about a teacher, her class assigned her to learn how to do a cartwheel, and they gave her YouTube clips, and they watched her, they coached her, you know, it was hysterically funny. She never got that fabulous, but she did get better, and just <laughs> by making um, not being perfect socially acceptable, making learning what's mm -hmm. acceptable, but and risking a little bit, uh, creating that culture. Mm -hmm. You know, at the end of two or three years, every teacher is going to the assembly mm -hmm. and saying, this is what I'm trying to learn. I'm trying mm -hmm. to learn Catalan. Uh, you know, here's my three words of vocabulary. Uh, mm -hmm. And then people saying, good for you, uh, and giving the people a bit of coaching so that you can see that learning happens. <laughs> Fun, though. <laughs> the last thing I'd say around that is that teachers want to do the right thing and they don't want to make a mistake, um, and they don't want to do anything that they, they think might harm their kids. And so we need to create the conditions where it's all right to try something and not have it work. And we really liked a school in Australia that has what they call Flop Friday, that every Friday at the end of the day they get together uh, and it may be at the pub, wherever, <laughs> and they say, what was the one thing that you did this week that was a real disaster? And you can laugh about it, and then the conversation is, what are you going to do now as a result? What are you going to do next? So to just create that space where it's safe to try something, what it's not okay to do is to try something, it doesn't work, and then give up. It's we're going to try something, and then what are we going to do next? And, and you, could, oh, sorry, yes. you could learn from Finland, because you know we're all sort of comparable sizes. Um, they have, apparently, in October, a National Day of Failure, where everybody celebrates uh, something that they've done wrong that hasn't worked, and, and people come into the schools and talk about uh, you know, what they learned from that failure. And I think you know, if we could wave our magic wand over British Columbia and the Yukon mm -hmm. and the Catalan, how much fun would that be? You know, here's here's what I tried, and it ended up, you know, being, uh, you know, stickets or uh, something good, an invention. <laughs> that it's really important to take responsibility ourselves. So, so, you know, when I was a, a teacher, it was easy for me to blame my principal, 
like if only he did this, my life would be so much better. And then I was a principal, and then I'd say, well, if only you know the district did this. And then it was, well, if only the government did this. And and I've worked in all of those roles, so I've learned that in every place, like blaming somebody else doesn't work. Um, also, we've we've learned that holding up. Um, individuals or holding up schools as the gold standard isn't necessarily that helpful either. So anyway, we've just say no blame, no shame, like trying something and not having it work is okay. So no blame, no shame, and no fame, <laughs> that we all have something to contribute. So taking responsibility, um, don't blaming others, don't humiliate anybody, and don't hold up you know, the golden icon. And that's why the language you're using is, from our perspective, good. Like, having a reference school where you can go and see some things, mm -hmm. you know, that you can refer to it, that's a lot different than saying, and here's our model school. You know, mm -hmm. that immediately, at least for our Canadian teachers, they say, well, I don't want to go there. It's a model. Maybe I'm not like that. You know, I'm not beautiful and elegant. But a reference school where I can learn something? Sure, I'll go there. So... I taught secondary and then intermediate and then primary. I went entirely the wrong way. It should go the other way. Uh, because I was trying to answer that question. Why aren't, why aren't these young people curious about the poetry I'm teaching? So I, how could you not like poetry? I, I think the answer is you want everybody to engage in the processes because they're mm -hmm. powerful processes that can give you a sense of teamwork and a sense of collective efficacy, which is a good thing. Uh, Absolutely, it helps to have the elementary schools sending on learners and staff who, who know how to think in these ways. Um, in secondary, I think a lot of our experience has been that the, the youngest group, for us it's grade eight, if the team that works with that group will begin to mm -hmm. teach the growth mindset even, they don't, even if they don't know it, that that can build a base. But we have seen, there's a school again in Australia, a secondary school, where once a week, Every teacher asks um, their class, one of their classes, what is something that we did this week in our learning together that worked for you? And what's one thing that we could do differently that would work for you better? And just the fact that young people are being asked that, it didn't take very much long, or it didn't take too long, that school has transformed because young people feel that they're being listened to. It's, you know, you want to be a democratic Catalan, well, you need to listen to the voices. And this was a powerful change. They actually did it twice a week. We wouldn't do that. We would do it once a week because we're more conservative. But I think, I think you have to, it has to be everybody and it has to be the universities too. Yeah, I just say, yes, secondary is more difficult and it's very important. And one piece of advice, do not separate your networks into elementary and secondary, have them together. Uh, we've seen that, that that teamwork is really, really important, so it was encouraging today to see that there were secondary schools there with the, the, the primary. Um, and the other thing I think for secondary students who have become kind of enculturated in a s certain way, just to take small steps with them and let the, the kids see that it's not the end of the world that you're trying something different. <laughs> and, and I would also add, you've got a stronger early childhood uh, approach than we do. Mm -hmm. we, we want yours, but we have mm -hmm. our not very good one. Um, we're trying to use the same approach there, and as we work on well-being, we're mm -hmm. trying to get doctors and nurses to mm -hmm. to think in these same ways, so that again we can we mm -hmm. can get a, mm -hmm. a an energy going that we're talking ab about the same kinds of things. 